Okay, let's do another one of these, huh? Wish you were here, we, you know. Huh. Uh, this job is way more fun when there's people and we can talk. And part of the goal here is that I'm not supposed to teach you everything. I, you know, this is, I'm supposed to uh, encourage you to be a, like a lifelong learner and stuff we're dealing with today and the stuff we'll deal with throughout the course documentaries you'll be 50 years old watching the discovery channel you know oh dang it there's a you know and i remember that class i had in college like that so so the thing is is that um you know we're dealing with lifelong things here so i'm not covering a whole lot but i'm giving you i hope the little sparks the little little frameworks to 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 deal with this thing one thing we last time we looked at this fertile crescent it's a big deal it's a great mystery it's a some, you know, the, the, things just don't happen all over the world. They're, they're like, there are places on earth that then affect all of history. Uh, they reverberate out of just some small places. It's, history isn't happening everywhere at all times. It's, it actually is, is uh, generated out of activities and people and places. And this is, this is what makes history so fascinating. And it's also so mysterious, history. Uh, but... On the other hand, it's less, is with this fertile crescent, is, is this place that's sort of magical in history for Jews, Muslims, Christians, you know, these great civilizations. That, and like we talk about this one family, and from this one family story, we get a really very straightforward picture of how the fertile crescent travel systems work, how the economies go, how the, you know, that there's cities developing, that there's you know, separation of Lot and Abraham over land, you know, grazing land and city. And then you get these stories, which are great theological stories, that's, you know, story of salvation, but, uh, but they're rooted in really sort of nitty-gritty stuff, like the buying of land for a tomb. You know, and why? You know, why is this tomb such a big deal? Well, tombs are, you know, indicators of memory. And so this is where we're going to... Who wrote all this down? The tradition is that... Genesis is written by Moses, and there's a lot of truth in it. Probably, probably not the whole truth. You know, uh, uh, these are old documents, much edited, much fiddled with, all sorts of stuff. But at the same time, the idea that Moses is the first person we have in the Bible that is said to be educated, and how we know he's said to be educated is that he's in the situation to be educated. You know, which is being raised uh, by. You know, uh, an adoption system in the uh, in the palace of Egypt, which is the you know uh, the greatest sort of intellectual center of the world, really, if you want to think about it. At that time, uh, we don't know exactly how much. We'll get to China and other places, and there's there's a, certainly intellectual activity going on all over the world, but stuff that gets written down in a way we can actually use as evidence. Well, that's Egypt, okay, and. And so uh, we know that he, he, Moses comes out of this, this structure, and he's ra raised in the palace, so there would have been that palace education for him. But we know clearly from the documents that we get coming down to us that Moses is told to write things down. He's told to collect documents, to create a little library. And so this becomes, okay, okay, that's, that's the, we, we're not told in Genesis that Moses wrote it down but we sort of have a tradition, a deep tradition, and I think a commonsensical tradition, that Moses and a mosaic, and that ick at the end, which is the stuff of the times of Moses, the people around Moses, that Moses created a situation in which scholarship began to develop. And this scholarship not only wrote things down, it you know, kept memories, wrote them down, but then it also collected them, put them together in these mosaic books, uh, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, this stuff that, that you're reading. And so Moses is a fascinating figure. And so we want to talk about Moses today. Now, Moses is here again, and I'm going to say this a lot. I'm like Donald Trump, huge, huge. Moses is huge. And the, uh, the thing is that... Uh, uh, we see in these documents the beginnings of discussion of freedom and slavery, of good government and bad government, 
of the use of senates and elders and and we don't find yet and this is very important we're going to see coming later in the course veto and term limits but a lot of the things we call republican government separation of powers things like this advise and consent uh, pop, uh, popular sovereignty these sort of ideas we begin to see in these mosaic documents now uh, that's why Moses is actually pictured in our in our uh, uh, United States Capitol building in the in, uh, these uh, in the House of Representatives these uh, pictures these bas reliefs of, of uh, lawgivers you know and, and great thinkers Moses is there and then uh, this is a book came out in 2011, uh, The Hebrew Republic, Jewish Sources and the Transformation of European Political Thought. Eric Nelson is a political scientist at Harvard, and he has written what I think is a great book, and it talks about basically the stuff we talk about here in World Civ, which he goes back to like the year of Jubilee, which we're going to talk about. And he sees this, and he sees, and he sees in the structure that Moses develops, and this mosaic culture develops, this political structures, we see the Jewish sources of what are called the Hebrew Republic, Republican systems of government in Hebrew and in, among the Jews, which then were looked upon during the uh, Renaissance. Uh, they went, the Hebrew scholarship really boomed up. And so, so in the Hebrew scholarship of the Renaissance, political ideas from the Bible got pushed up. We tend to, and in the Middle Ages, they tended to think of, of the Old Testament about kings, you know, King David, Solomon. No, 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 no. Renaissance said, no, no, no. Uh, the Old Testament's not about kings. It's about a different political structure we can call Republican, which has separations of power and things like that. And so uh, uh, this is Eric Nelson's thesis, which is a really true thesis, which is that our founding, like the founding fathers of the United States are deeply in reading the Bible as a support for certain types of Republican things that we have written into our Constitution. So, uh, you know, the best scholarship of the last, you know, decade and so has really been much more back off from this idea that, that the Enlightenment secularized government and we have republics and the Bible was put away. No, 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 Alexander Hamilton, all these people, uh, they were reading their Bibles very carefully, quoting their Bibles in letters and stuff like that. And looking to this Hebrew Republic, not as the source, or, or you know, we're not going to copy the Hebrew Republic, but we want to use that, that the fact that Republican notions are ancient and, and have this authority which comes from ancient scripture. So, uh, that's what I want to talk about today. It's just, just give you an inkling of this mosaic, okay? We don't have to pin everything on Moses himself, but his era of of this beginning of Hebrew scholarship, when the Hebrew language is forming and getting things written down, putting things into uh, uh, books and such, okay? Uh, one of the fun things here is that, again, uh, Moses is presented in the story not as a king. He is not a monarch, and in fact, there's a type of uh, uh, threesome, you know, that run things, you know? There's a priest, which is Aaron, his brother, and then there's Miriam, his older sister, who's sort of key to the whole story because she's the one who puts him in or finds him in the, bo the boat and gets him take, put into the, you know, she's key and she's the one who sings a song coming across. Yeah, she's great. Uh, and both Aaron and Miriam, though, go bad like everyone does in the Bible. There's no heroes of, you know, perfect heroes in the Bible. And then uh, Moses then has to pull together the center between this sort of threesome and so always remember that there's this sort of threesome going on in this mosaic thing and what you have is one of the first things they're told to do is to build an ark and this ark you know this is where Raiders of the Lost Ark and this is what is described as you know it's, it's, it's a box it's a box to carry things it's a it, you know if you want to think about it as modern times it's you know it's it's a bookmobile or something like that but what we have is this story, of a long story, in which what we're doing, and notice it's not called the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant's a New Testament term. Old Testament is Ark of the Testimony. Testimony is a, is a term we historians love. It's a judicial term. We'll talk about this. 
His, historians work with judicial logic, judicial proof. You know, we're not scientists. We're not in lab coats, you know. So, so the thing is, is so we, we in, these, in this judicial form, testimony, testimony that comes in from eyewitnesses, testimony that comes in from oral or written sources, there's hearsay testimony, lots of ways. We, de we deal with information that comes to us from social sources. And what do we do is we make decisions, we do all sorts of things with testimony and history and the judicial courts and stuff, figuring out like who, what happened in the courts. But this is an arc of the testimony. It's the arc where we keep all this stuff. And so what would be is, you know, the traditional belief, it makes sense, it's commonsensical, is that Genesis was written during this time by Moses and then put into the ark. Uh, or if not written by Moses, it, Moses would have charged other scholars, other people of education, or he might have been training up some of these educational folks we call scribes. We'll talk about that more later. These scribes who would have gone out and, and cobbled together the oral stories that then come together as the book of Genesis. But that thing would have been put into the ark and carried around. And so the ark becomes a type of document, file cabinet, uh, collecting things, you know. And it's also going to have museum pieces. It's going to have the staff of Moses. You know, we hear about it later in the Bible. It's going to have even the tablets, the stone tablets of Moses and stuff. But a lot of stuff's being written on papyrus. Now, I don't, ever, don't think that everything's being written on stone and they're carrying around this big bulky box of rocks. It's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the Egyptians had developed pyrus. They, we have alphabets, and we have a very efficient writing systems. And so, so uh, scribal culture has to be there to protect the ark, take care of the ark. And then, of course, the documents fall apart after 100 or 150 years. And so you have to actually copy them and transfer them over and stuff. But we have the creation of what is going to be the ark that carries the important information. And it's, uh, this is that scholarly sort of world. Now, your arc is this. You know, we have a thing which we'll talk about later, the, the development of a codex. And, you know, we got a whole bunch of books, a little bookmobile right here, all lined up in your Bible. It's a, it's a, it's a library. It's a, and <laughs> later on, it's going to get called a hive. It's going to be a honeycomb with a hive. And it's going to, we'll talk about that later in the class when we get to the Christian scholarship and stuff. But on the other hand, it's like right at the bottom is this scholarly tradition of which politics, good government, civilization is going to be founded. And so we're going to not look at the religious stuff so much in here. We're going to look at the, the roots of political stuff that's in this, this Bible. So you have this, and it's collected in this ark. Uh, so let's whip over to what is the... Uh, um, uh, let's go to Deuteronomy 25. This... Whole Deuteronomy and Leviticus, they collect a whole bunch of stuff. It's a, don't even think about it as chronological. It's just a, it's a collection. It's a bunch of documents stuck in an ark. What, what, where, where did my 25 go? There's 24. There's 25. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Am I right? Deuteronomy. What did I tell you guys to read? Deuteronomy 15, was it? Maybe it's 15. Yeah, there we go. It's 14 and 15. Look at this. Why in the world would you do that? Canceling debts is unjust. Someone has lent money to someone, and you're going to tell that person that he doesn't or she doesn't have to pay money back for money they've lent? That's, that's not just. Well, it is just. It's just in a bigger picture. And we do this constantly in the modern world. What do we call debt cancellation law today? I'll wait. Bankruptcy. Bankruptcy law. All sorts of bankruptcy law. President Trump went bankrupt several times. I think he's bankrupt all the time. <laughs> but, but the thing is, like, like he's a, the, it's a, bankruptcy law is a, a fundamental way that when you can't pay back your debts, we drop, we, we don't, we, we drop it, okay? So, so the thing is, is, is you have a, uh, um, uh, a system which is designed to seek a higher justice by actually not being just at a lower level, at a sort of particular level. And this is most important in the ancient world because this is how people become slaves. 
is people sell them. We're going to run into this a lot, and we'll talk about this more and more as we go through. People sell themselves into slavery because they cannot afford to pay their debts. And so we'll, we'll see where our laws that end slavery for the Greeks and stuff. Well, this is an anti-slavery law in the, the Bible in which we want to, um, you know, keep, keep people from falling into debt, and debt would lead to slavery. This notion of the rich and the poor, uh, that's very important for this here, is so that you have a, you may require payment from a foreigner, but you must cancel any debt to your brother who owes you. However, there should be no poor among you. Now, the key word there is there should be no poor. We want to, Mosaic law lays out a, a, a goal, a, a principle. There should be no poor among you. On the other hand, verse 11, there always will be poor among you. This is, I, I present to you, this is, a, this is a great wisdom, you know. And this is where you separate what should be from what is. And these are the kind of practical situations which civilization at its highest level is built around. We have goals. We have ideals. We, have, we know things where we want to be. But we have to compromise. We have to mitigate. We have to you know, muck, muck around in the, in the, in the grit of, of real life. And there's always going to be poor with you. And so what are you supposed to do? There should be no poor. There's always going to be poor. So what are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Don't be hard-hearted. Don't be tight-fisted. Okay. It's a beautiful chapter. So I think it's a chapter to come back to for society throughout history in all places. It's this principles of, of our goals and our realities, and especially the fact that, that uh, we are to, we being the, uh, the scribal class, the scholarly class, the educated class, this, this reading and running government and doing these sort of laws and being judges and lawyers and all that sort of stuff, are to be not hard-hearted, not tight-fisted, and ultimately to lean to help people. Even if it's unjust, even if, it, even if the rich deserve to be paid back, we are going to lean and give favor to the poor. Okay, that's a, that's a great law. And, and let me give you another one like it, you know, which you read, which is really one of the, the, real, the real great ones, is the year of Jubilee here. And uh, this is the Levitical law. And uh, this is like you have seven years. So seven times seven is 49. You're supposed to do those Sabbatarian uh, laws of uh, getting people off the debt, you know, uh, every seven years. And then, and then the 49 and then the 50th year. 50th year, this is a, this is a crazy law. It, and this is where Eric Nelson brings this up in his book on the Hebrew Republic. It's a redistribution of land law. It's a type of law in which we see a type of uh, golden age or a, a principle like okay the, where there was a time where land is 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 well distributed and then basically the rich are going to get richer the poor are going to get poorer uh, people will lose land the rich will gain land you know land will accumulate here disappear here and so we need to every 50 years go back we need to readjust okay and it's this year of jubilee it's a readjustment and then we have you know, you'll hear the term throughout your life, and people, popes and stuff, will declare use years of jubilee. It's a, it's a great idea. You'll hear jubilee singers and stuff like that. But one of the interesting things here is this is a present to you how sophisticated the thought is. If you sell land to one of your countrymen or buy from him, do not take advantage. See, here's this: do not take advantage of you because if you think about this 50-year system, you know, you could as a capitalist, you know mess with the system for your own benefit. Well, you're not supposed to do that, okay? Uh, basically, what you're doing is leasing land. Uh, you are buying from your countrymen on the basis of the number of years since the Jubilee. So you're actually leasing land. You're not owning it. He used to sell it to you on the basis of the number of years left for harvesting crops. So the price actually diminishes as we get closer to the, uh, to the Jubilee. Uh, because um, in reality, you are not selling the land, but you are selling the number of crops. Do not take advantage of each other, but fear God, okay? Uh, this, is, this, this is very sophisticated law, and, and it's still this kind of 
thinking that goes in, okay, there's justice, but then there's the practicalities of actual capitalism and stuff. Like we have laws which to keep monopolies uh, from being formed. So yeah, you're rich and rich and rich, you get richer and richer, but let's stop it there. We are not gonna let this accumulation of wealth destroy the freedoms and the, the dynamism of this end, you know, and stuff like that. We have all sorts of these kind of laws. And where do they root themselves? Where do we first see something that has this kind of sophistication? Is it in Greece? No. Is it in Egypt? No. Is it in China? No. It's in the Bible. It's in, it's in these ancient books where we're just not sure how they got formed, but they were carried around in a box through the desert, apparently, called the Ark of the Testimonies. Um, I want to get back to one more here, uh, which is that you know, weird fun law, the uh, um, uh, cities of refuge. What cities of refuge is, uh, at one level, is a type of what kind of law? We have them today. It's a change of venue law. And, uh, the, when, like, there's a congressman killed, congresswoman killed over in Arizona, and um, they did the court case here in San Diego because they didn't feel like it could be fair in uh, uh, getting a jury and stuff. And, and you see, that's, Every once in a while, because of the heat of the moment, because of the people's angers and stuff like that, you need to, you need to move a change of venue. And as you read in there, you don't get a, you don't, the person who moves to a city of refuge doesn't get off. No, there's a new court case. And what we have is a, it's a situation especially to help when you accidentally kill someone. Uh, this to diminish feudal law and create a type of more stable legal system in which People can be recognized for accidentally killing someone, and therefore um, we we don't we stop this sort of eye for an eye sort of system. So all I'm doing with this here is we are not doing a sophisticated, deep study of mosaic law and ancient history and all that sort of stuff. But what we're doing is I'm giving you the principles here of this Hebrew Republic. We're gonna talk more about it as we go through, and we'll we'll see this Hebrew Republic as it develops. But but the thing is is we have a uh, uh, roots uh, of, of sophisticated thinking. Um, here again, we're not doing anthropology, we're not doing archeology, span where we're sort of like making this up ourselves. We're actually seeing evidence written down in ancient documents of things like we have today called bankruptcy law, you know, change of venue law, okay? So uh, we'll uh, come back on Monday and we'll be able to Hopefully Zoom together, huh? We'll talk.